Hi, my name is Lee Finnegan. I am a first year pediatrics resident, and I am also a uh, USMLE tutor and content creator with Med School Coach. And um, today, our question of the week is for the USMLE Step 2, uh, or any number of shelf exams, most likely going to be the pediatric shelf, um, but could show up on a different one as well. So uh, here we go. A 17-year-old boy presents to the emergency department after collapsing during a football game. On presentation, he is in cardiac arrest with pulseless electrical activity. Despite resuscitative measures, he is pronounced dead. An image of his heart on autopsy is shown. Which of the following physical examination findings was most likely present when he was alive? A, systolic murmur that increases in intensity when going from supine to upright. B, opening snap followed by low diastolic rumble. C, brachiofemoral pulse delay. D, hyperdynamic pulse. E, intermittent cyanosis or F, irregularly irregular heart rhythm. So there's a couple of giveaways in this question. First of all, the things you need to know are what is, you need to, you need to understand what the question is asking you. So you need to figure out which physical exam finding was present. So to do that, you kind of need to know what the diagnosis is. It's gonna be hard even with this picture if you don't know what the diagnosis is and know the associations to figure it out. It's not impossible if you have like a really good grasp of cardiac physiology, but most likely you're just going to be trying to look for the buzzwords in this one. So um, the, this is a very classic uh, presentation of this disease, and you can kind of tell from a couple of different hints. One is that he's a 17-year-old, so he's a kid, um, after collapsing during a football game. Uh, collapsing during exercise is essentially never normal. Um, it's one of those things that they always ask, like if you remember when you were a kid, they would like always ask during your sports physicals if you had ever lost consciousness when you were running or something like that. And they'd also ask you if you had any family history of someone dying suddenly. This is the disease that they were getting at when they asked you about that. So he's, he is in cardiac arrest. So this isn't just a case of syncope or something like that. This is a cardiac arrest that occurred during activity in a seemingly otherwise healthy 17-year-old boy. Um, and then we have this image of his heart on autopsy. So we can tell that this is not a normal heart. And there's a little bit of a hint with that little ruler on there, but what's abnormal here is the size of the ventricular. Oh, you can't see that at all. Um, what's abnormal here is the size of the ventricular muscle. So uh, particularly the left ventricle. So here is our left ventricle, here's our right ventricle, here's our left atrium, and here's our right atrium. And the biggest thing we see is the size of this left ventricular muscle. It's huge. This is the left ventricular free wall right here that we're looking at. And this is the left ventricular septum, is the interventricular septum. The size of the interventricular septum is the real characteristic thing about the disease that this otherwise healthy 17 year old has. And that's the answer that you need to come up with before you figure out what physical exam finding he would have had. So the answer to this, to the disease that gives, you, um, that gives you septal hypertrophy, so hypertrophy of the interventricular septum and can lead to sudden death in an otherwise healthy person at a young age is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or HOPEN. So let's talk about that a little bit before we get to what the answer is. So uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is a, um, is a uh, congenital or familial disease. Um, which causes concentric hypertrophy of the ventricular muscle, particularly the septum. So if you look at the difference here between these two pictures, on the left here, you have your normal heart with a normal sized ventricle, ventricular muscle and a normal sized, normal sized interventricular septum. On the right side, you have a thickened ventric left ventricular muscle for sure, but an incredibly thick interventricular septum. And this is what differentiates it from acquired causes of uh, left ventricular uh, hypertrophy, things that happen when you have longstanding hypertension or when you have aortic stenosis or something like that, and you have all that increased afterload that your heart is trying to pump against and you get hypertrophy of that muscle, and it's the hypertrophy of the septum. The septal hypertrophy is really what keys you off that this isn't just your regular old run-of-the-mill acquired um, cardiomyopathy um, or yeah, acquired um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but that this is hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which is a different beast entirely. We have no reason to believe that this 17-year-old uh, had some kind of history of chronic hypertension or something like that. So um, 
And his heart, again, doesn't look like the heart of someone who had chronic hypertension. It looks like the heart of someone with hope. So it's caused by a mutation in the sarcomere proteins, which causes increased sarcomeres to be added in parallel rather than in series. That's what gives you that, um, that thickening of the muscle. It results, results in decreased compliance of the, left, of the left ventricle and diastolic dysfunction. As you can imagine, a heart that looks like this is not going to be able to relax very well, and you have this very small left ventricular chamber that's not going to be able to fill up very well because that heart muscle can't relax because those walls are so big. So that's what this kid has. He has hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. How does hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy kill you? Well, it's in the name right here. It's obstructive. So it's caused by an obstruction of the, um, it, the, the way that it kills you is when you have systolic anterior motion, systolic anterior motion of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which obstructs the outflow tract. So if we can see, if we look in these pictures here, in a hokum heart, we have this thickened septum. And because of this thickened septum, we're kind of cramping where the mitral valve can go and where its leaflets can go. So the anterior leaflet, instead of going normally, has this, at, well, that's actually the wrong valve that I circled there. That's the aortic valve. This is the one I meant to circle, is the mitral valve. Um, the anterior leaflet goes abnormally anteriorly during systole because when this heart contracts, which is uh, here in the picture we're showing, we're seeing a diastole um, because it's where the heart is filling up. But when it contracts during systole, that's that anterior um, leaflet of the mitral valve is pushed anteriorly, and it can actually block this outflow tract. That's kind of what we're getting at here, although again, it's showing it in diastole, which is a little unfortunate, but that's kind of what we're getting at here, is that we have that systolic anterior motion of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which can block off the outflow tract. So obviously, if you're blocking the outflow tract during systole, then blood cannot get out the aortic valve and out to the rest of the body, can't feed the coronaries, and causes uh, cardiac arrest. You're more prone to have this happen when you're in, when, during exercise, um, and so that is why the uh, that is why the most the sort of classic presentation of this is someone who has a sudden cardiac death um, during exercise or during like a sports game or something like that. And this is caused by a pressure gradient that pushes that leaflet anteriorly. So now we know that this kid had hope, which again, we can kind of, if you kind of get good at these things, when you look at this picture, like when you see a picture like this with that big leaflet, and when you hear about a, seven, about a healthy teenager who dies during exercise, hokum should be the top of your list. Hokum and arrhythmias would be um, on that story. You could also have some kind of, you know, some kind of congenital arrhythmia or something like that. This picture is going to be hokum 100% of the time. So now we need to figure out what is the physical exam finding. So again, if you're really good at cardiac physiology, you can probably try to figure this out, or if you're good with just your associations. So hokum. Symptoms, syncope on exertion like this kid had, although it wasn't really syncope, right? It was death. Sudden cardiac death, especially in young athletes. It causes a murmur, it causes a systolic murmur which increases with maneuvers that decrease left ventricular volume. It increases with maneuvers that decrease left ventricular volume. So let's think about that for a second. Remember, what's happening here is obstruction, right? We're getting obstruction of the outflow tract. And, uh, and so having more blood in that ventricle actually sort of opens this up a little bit and sort of opens up that narrow, so makes that space the, in the outflow tract less narrow. So more blood makes that space less narrow. Less narrowing means less, tu less turbulent flow means less of a murmur. So when you have hokum, you have a systolic murmur because it's, it's systolic because it's happening when blood is trying to get out the left ventricular outflow tract. So when blood is going from the ventricle into the aorta, so it's a systolic murmur that decreases with increased volume in the left ventricle. So decreases with increased preload in the left ventricle. So if it decreases with increased preload, what kind of maneuvers 
would decrease or increase your MRR. So it's going to increase with less preload. It's going to be inverse of preload, right? It's going to increase with less preload and decrease with more preload. So it's going to decrease, it's going to increase with decreased preload, things like Valsalva and standing up. And it's going to decrease with maneuvers that increase left ventricular volume. Um, things like hand grip and squatting, which will increase your afterload and therefore increase the volume in your ventricle. This, it should be noted, is the opposite from a lot of other things that cause systolic murmurs because normally more preload means more flow, which means more murmur. Hokum is different from other systolic murmurs in that more preload actually means less murmur because you're opening up that space. So if we go back to our question, if we look at choice A, systolic murmur that increases in intensity when going from supine to upright. So what happens when you go from supine to upright? I'm lying down and then I sit up. And what happens to my preload? It decreases, right? Preload in the left ventricle decreases because you have, um, because you have sort of more blood pooling lower in the body. You have less blood coming to the heart. So that will cause your, that will cause your preload to decrease and will increase your, oops, that was the highlighter, and will increase your obstruction in the outflow tract, and that will cause your murmur to increase. So the answer here is A. We can talk about these other, um, we can talk about these other answers here, just to kind of go through them a little bit. Um, I apologize, my computer froze a little bit. Um, <laughs> we can go through these other answers uh, just to talk about sort of the other, uh, I'm sorry. There we go. All right, so opening snap followed by low diastolic rumble. That is caused by, that is mitral stenosis. Here, let me make this a little bit. That's mitral stenosis. It's a diastolic murmur, which means it's happening during diastole. So when your mitral valve is open, you're trying to pass a bunch of fluid through that stenotic valve. And so that's why you're gonna get a murmur with um, a murmur during diastole. Brachiofemoral pulse delay happens in coarctation of the aorta. Hyperdynamic pulse. Um, so hyperdynamic pulse is something that you see uh, frequently in aortic regurgitation. Um, that's or that water hammer pulse that you sometimes hear about and that's because you have blood that's going out and then coming back in and then going out and then coming back in and going out and coming back in. That's kind of how I think about it. So you've got increased blood coming out and then it's going back in. So it's sort of like whoosh, 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 whoosh. That's the sort of water hammer pulse or the hyperdynamic pulse. So that's aortic regurgitation. Intermittent cyanosis can occur in a whole bunch of causes of cyanotic congenital heart disease. Things like tetralogy of flow, um, things like that, which can have, where, you know, changes in your pulmonary vascular pressure um, can result in varying degrees of cyanosis. Um, so tetralogy of flow is really going to be your big one that you see there. And then an irregularly irregular heart rhythm most often refers to AFib. Now, again, we said that um, certain kinds of congenital arrhythmias could result in sudden cardiac death, particularly during exercise. Um, AFib generally is not a congenital arrhythmia, so it would be very unlikely for a 17-year-old to have AFib. Um, although, honestly, with all of his uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and this sort of, uh, whoops, and this maybe like bigger left atrium, very possible that he could have had AFib. Um, but unlikely, less likely that that would cause it than just his, um, or than just his, uh, his hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Plus, from this picture, we know he had hokum. We, it's kind of a stretch to think that he might have had AFib on top of that. Um, and there are other arrhythmias that can cause this, but AFib really wouldn't be one of them. Um, they would be other sort of congenital arrhythmias, channelopathies, that kind of thing. So the important thing in this question is that this story and this picture are very classic for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that is a, um, and this systolic murmur that increases with decreased preload um, is, uh, is the very classic physical finding. And again, this is why when you had sports physicals as a teenager, they would always, um, they would always have you lay down and then stand up and then squat and do all of those things and then listen to your heart and all of those positions to try to elicit if a murmur changes with position. 
um, because if you have a systolic murmur that increases with intensity when you go from laying down to standing up, that's a sign that you have um, hokum and maybe shouldn't exercise. All right, that is our question of the week today.